Hi, I'm Birdman Mel, and I am so, so happy to be with you tonight, and I'm so happy that you're with me. It's been quite the week. If you ever have anyone, if you're in the middle of the country that has need of heart surgery, particularly a bowel replacement, go to St. Luke's. I am so happy with the job they did with my mother, and that's why I'm here tonight. I, I'm just so thankful to the Lord that he watched over her. But you know what? We're going to talk about a lot of fun things tonight besides that recovery, and we want you to share what's going on in your week. I know I just posted today that when I was up at Mom's, I saw Monarch Butterfly, and we're going to be talking with uh, Jill Edwards next week on butterflies, and uh, I want you to think about tuning in on that, but you know, we saw a hummingbird come back too, so come online and let us know what, what happened to you that you love, but most of all, like we do every week, where are you from? We love knowing what state you're from. It helps Stan, and Stan Tequila's going to be with me. You guys love him. He's the author that does so many of the books we all love, our state guides. He's got some new beginner guides, and then we covered a couple weeks ago the bird migration book, some of the things in there. So Stan will be on in a second. He'll be talking about how do birds cope with this old winter? You know, how do they stay warm in the wintertime? And, uh, you know, how do the, what different birds are we going to see that we don't normally see? And there's actually been a report we mentioned just a bit last week. Uh, I call it the Finch Report. Some people, it's the kind of a pine seed, pine cone seed report. He's, he's going to touch on that because some of us are going to get a bunch of birds perhaps, and some already are because of some things that's happened up in Canada. So fun things going on. If you know somebody that would like this, please tag them and please like us. Get the word out. That helps you win a prize and it helps them win a prize. The other thing I want you to do, because I love giving out prizes, is, you know, go ahead and ask questions and answer questions and, you know, let us know how we're doing because this is all about hearing from you and, and covering the things you want to cover. i got Mr. Jeffrey here tonight and he's going to be slipping me your questions as we go. Although this program Stan's putting on has never been seen before and many of the photos have never been seen before. So you are in for what's really, you know, one of those big preview deals like they roll off the red carpet at the studios and stuff. But i got to put the commercial in real quick. I've, I've gotten used to this when we've got guest speakers on, and some people picked some of this for me, and, and they didn't know I'd covered some of it before, so we're going to be able to go quick. But on the gifty side, you know, we like to talk about things we love on the gifty side. Well, nothing beats a cardinal in the snow. So I just wanted to remind you, if you're in central Missouri, you can get these things at Songbird Station. If you're not, your local retailer can get them. So reach out to that independently on Wild Bird Store or Lawn and Garden or... Uh, hardware store that's really serious about birding, but we've got a really cool thermometer and we got a really good clock that are, are got cardinals on them. And speaking of cardinals, I like these old boys. They're hand carved out of Ibasia. And I see my finches and some of the folks, the little chickadees go, and speaking of chickadees, can't be, yeah, hello, how are you? This is Mr. Chickadee saying hi to Mr. Cardinal. Hello, hello. And uh, they, they use these to hide from the cold winds as, as they do these roosting pockets here. I got all these roosting pockets all around me. Mr. Kevin, you can tell he decorated up everything for me today because there's a lot of stuff. But these little woven things are just the way them and maybe a buddy can get in there and stand out of those winter winds, okay? Another one Kevin put out for me is, you know, for the guys that don't want to go inside a hole like that, just a little shelf. This is, you know, we do this as a robin or a phoebe nest, but also in the wintertime it ends up being a nice place to, you know, break the wind if you position it right. Last but not least, a couple functional products I love. Kevin picked out, and I agree, is we got our all-weather feeder. This was invented by a guy up in Rochester, Minnesota years ago, and God almighty, it snows up there, don't it? Anybody out there from New York, give a holler. But this bird feeder is absolutely, totally weatherproof, and the birds can come in here when it's a blizzard. They eat up here in this little bitty hole, so just let you use sunflower kernels. People that get so upset at this feeder use other stuff, so use kernels. It's a great, great feeder. The other thing we got going on, I don't know if you can see it here, but we got all kinds of feeders. With, we got these here covers. We bend these covers here, these plexi covers. This is over one of our trays. And uh, just a neat way, I just love looking out and it's snow all over the cover, but here they all are eating it here in the middle. Mr. Uh, Cardinal and his buddies, everybody's in there. So that's really cool. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Kevin didn't know I talked about it, but guess what? My main man likes some of the same stuff I do. This is a songbird spa, heated bird bath. And my first question for you is how many, how much does it cost to run a bird bath a day? You know, just give me a guess about what you think it's going to cost because that's going to win you a prize. And why would we even worry about having heated water for a bird, okay? But this one here is pretty cool. It can go on the deck, it goes on the ground, goes on a post, all kinds of stuff. 
And then we got our own heated bird bath heater here. And big old long cord. So many of them got a short cord, it's hard. I mean, this is like farmers use putting in the stock tanks. I mean, the cows get him to carry these rascals up. Really like this guy. And you're gonna be surprised how little it costs to run it. But both of these are from Songbird Essentials. It's called the Songbird Spa and the Songbird Bird Bath and multi-use heater. You can put these, you know, in a koi pond or in a fountain you wanna keep running. All that sort of thing. So two good uses there. So that's the end of the commercials. I hope you liked what I showed you tonight. Let's get on to the star of the show. Mr. Stan, are you over there? Are you still on with me? I'm here, Mel. I'm here. Boy, I was worried. Stan told me besides what's going on here tonight, I guess you set up cameras last night to do it, but you said you even got a flying squirrel attack going on at the moment. You okay? Yeah, <laughs> Um, I've got uh, flying squirrels here in uh, where I'm at in Minnesota, and uh, I feed them every night. So right when it gets dark, I go out and I give them a handful of uh, shelled peanuts and a handful of uh, like a peanut pickout, something kind of like that's out of the shells already. Uh -huh. I put them out, and my last night I had the halogen lights put out, and I was trying to film them as they were flying in. It's quite a as a as a wildlife you know uh, a photographer guy. This is a challenging thing, so I enjoy doing those types. I'd be out there right now if I wasn't talking to you. So. Well, thank you for sharing your night with us. And I hear you, you told me you, we're going to see some slides now in this show about uh, how they uh, survive the winter time that haven't been shown before. So bring them on. Let's let's let's. I want to learn something tonight, man. Yeah. So birds. How do birds survive winter? Um, <clears throat> truth be told, um, I uh, put together this uh, PowerPoint just to and I finished up maybe about a half hour, 45 minutes ago. So I kind of whipped it together. These are all my own photos and they're photos that uh, I really never published before. So they're just kind of interesting things, but I thought, let's take a look at it. Hopefully you can all see that. So how do birds survive winter? You gotta think about that type of stuff. Uh, now, oh sure, now my, my now I'm not gonna be working. Oh, here we go. So, you know, basically, uh, you know, how can anything survive this type of thing? I don't know about you. and. Of course, there you are in Missouri. You're not going to get that kind of winter like we would get, would you? And, well, uh, I wish we would. I remember I, we call them the old-fashioned winters down here. Yeah, yeah. This is called normal winter for us. Yeah. So, uh, so for many birds, winter is really actually a time of plenty. It's a time when birds do very well. Some birds do very well. One example of that would be, of course, the snowy owl. Snowy owls are really good at uh, taking advantage of these harsh conditions and they move out of these northern regions and they come down into areas every now and then in which to uh, 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 find some food. Um, and here's a little secret, Mel. I'm just, um, uh, tonight I'm just kind of showing off some of my photography too. Oh, beautiful. Some of these pictures are in here just because I'm, I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> images sitting in my files and I thought, well, it'd be great to show them off here. So winter can be a time of plenty for some uh, uh, birds and mostly our predators. So the uh, hawks and uh, and the owls and eagles in particular. So here's like a snowy owl. This is a this is an image of actually it's actually four different images put together to make one panel or a pan uh, panoramic uh, picture. So of course uh, the hunting can be easy for some of them. This is a great gray owl. Of course here in Minnesota we have great gray owls, and uh, so they they hunt in the winter time, and it's a time that's good for them. As you can see here, collected up. Can you? I don't know there, Mel. Can you tell me? Can you see that my mouse moving around here, on there? I don't know. Uh, I, yes, I, I barely can. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh. I got a little screen here that I use to All prompt right, me. Well, we, the people at home. But that's the mouse down there that yeah. he's holding, huh? Yeah. Or is that, no, no. What's he got? In his, what's he got? It's a it's a vole, and uh, he's got some grass with it too. He had caught a vole. Okay. And uh, had kind of gone through with it, so it's kind of an easy time for uh, the owls. They do pretty well uh, at that time of year. There's not a lot of vegetation for the mice to hide in. If the snow is only six to eight or 10 inches and it's light and fluffy, the, the, the rodents think that they can move around with impunity and there's no problem, but these owls can hear right through it and they can get right into them. Only later when the crust, if there's a crust on the snow, then there's some problems with the uh, birds uh, getting through. So uh, it can be a really good time for them. Again, I'm just kind of showing off some pictures here. This is a Northern hawk owl. Uh, uh, obviously here too. And here's a uh, Eastern screech owl. And these birds do fairly well in the winter time. But what about those smaller kind of non-migrating birds like the tiny uh, black cap chickadee or, 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 you know, the birds that we see on a regular basis in the winter time, 
winter can be a definite challenge for them. And uh, I wanted to spend tonight kind of talking about how the different strategies that these things uh, take to survive. And uh, really, at, at my nature center, we're always kind of, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, coming up with different things that um, to help people remember. We always remember the acronym MAD. You know, the, any and all animals, they need, to, they need to follow this here, this MAD. They either need to migrate, they need to adapt, or they're gonna die. And just about everything that's out there, like at this time of year, we have fall going on right now. This MAD is being put into place. The, the birds are gonna have to migrate to survive, or they're gonna have to adapt, or they're gonna die, or same thing for insects, or whatever it may be. Th th those are the options. And you thought you had a tough childhood, right? I mean, look at that. I mean, you, you gotta either migrate, adapt, or die. Ooh. So <clears throat> anyhow, so the, uh, these non-migrating birds, the birds that spend their winters with us, and again, this is a, a classic snowy winter for us here in Minnesota, um, the birds uh, uh, kind of have to have some seasonal changes, some things that will allow them to adapt to be able to make it through. And some of these are uh, growing more feathers um, or an extra layer of fat or huddling together at night. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about shivering to generate heat and torpor, which is a way to conserve um, heat and conserve fat, uh, conserve fat and so that they can survive the night. Basically, you got birds like this. This is a American uh, goldfinch, and they start out looking this fabulous in the summer, but then they end up looking like this in the winter time. So small birds like American goldfinches, black-capped chickadees, white-breasted nuthatches, they grow an additional one-third more feathers than they do normally. So in the summertime, a bird like a chickadee or a goldfinch is going to have, on average, about 1,200 feathers. So they're going to add on about another third more of their feathers, bringing them up closer to 2,000 or over 2,000 feathers uh, for the wintertime. Now, when you and I look at them, they look exactly the same to us. They don't look, I mean, the color may be different on them, but they don't look fatter. They don't look, you know, more. Uh, they just look like the same old bird, but they've actually put on these extra feathers. And those extra feathers tend to be in the form of down feathers. Down feathers are the ones that are underneath the contour feathers. Uh, so on this bird here, what we see here on the outside, these are contour feathers. Underneath that are the down feathers, and that's where the extra feathers are. And that is a, a really important adaptation to um, uh, survive winter. So, so besides, they, excuse yeah. me, Stan, so besides changing colors, those goldfinches when they are probably adding those those feathers, right? Yeah, and so uh, chickadees, nuthatches, all these small birds that that stay for the winter, they don't migrate. Uh, even cardinals add on extra feathers for the winter time. Mel, wouldn't you like to be able to do that? So for me, I'd just like to add on extra hair. That's all I want to do. <laughs> yeah, so, that'd be handy. Hey, yeah. I got a question somebody okay. asking. I think you're getting ready to answer it. How does a bird survive the high cold winds of winter? And I guess. <clears throat> so this is an interesting topic. Uh, let's just take a moment to kind of address this. I have a I have an ongoing argument going on with my dear friend, who uh, about does wind chill affect birds? So um, uh, we know that wind chill affects people because we have uh, bare skin, and that bare skin is what is uh, affected by the wind chill. And so um, since birds don't really have a whole lot of bare skin. Uh, I've always kind of maintained that the wind chill really doesn't affect them as much as it does affect people too. So, um, the, of course, we don't know. You know, we can't interview these these right. uh, birds because wind chill, for example, let's just say your car, your car doesn't is not affected by how hard the wind blows. You know, uh, it's not going to get any colder than what the air temperature is out there. So, you know, whether or not it, it affects these birds, we don't really know. So with these extra feathers, though, that chickadees and nuthatches and goldfinches and all like that grow for the wintertime, they can fluff them up. And when they fluff them up, they can capture more body heat near their, uh, or more heat near their body. And this is an important concept for them. So you oftentimes will see birds all fluffed up in the wintertime. And that is simply just a strategy and adaptation to help them keep their, uh, their heat close to their body there, too. Uh, extra layer of fat. Uh, so birds do this, and it's a balancing act that they have to uh, do with an extra layer of fat 
they don't use the fat kind of like you and I use the fat in that we use it as more like insulation or a mammal would use it like for insulation. Birds use the extra layer of fat as a fuel source to help to uh, keep them warm. So a little biology 101. We are a mammal, other furred animals are mammals out there, and we generate our heat by eating food. When we eat food, our stomach, our intestines uh, uh, break it all down. This is called motility. And during that motility, it produces heat that keeps our body warm. Now, birds are different. They shiver in order to keep warm. So their thermal regulating system is based on all their muscles in their body, all trembling like this, you know, kind of shaking and trembling. And that produces their heat. And to do that kind of shivering, they need to fuel it with fat. And that fat is how they put on extra layer of fat to do this. Now, you can't put on too much fat and still fly. So there's a balancing act going on there that they got to put on the fat to survive, but can't put on too much then you're grounded. And it's right, it's a right. real problem. So this shivering is very different, and it's something that a lot of people don't understand. And it needs you need to take this into you know how many times have you heard me say this, Mel? We oftentimes try to impose our human knowledge, our human kind of our experience with our own bodies, our own lives upon the birds, and we're almost universally wrong on this because they are very different from us. They're not mammals. Uh, they're a very different type of, uh, of creatures. We have to be careful about that, too. Another strategy for staying warm in the wintertime is at nighttime, the birds will gather together in a little crack or crevice or a, a natural cavity, whatever it may be, and they will huddle together. And if they're inside of a cavity, or sometimes we put out roosting boxes for them, right? I mean, roosting right. boxes are a great thing to put out. They'll get in those roosting boxes, and they'll huddle together, and that will help keep them a little bit warmer also. And then torpor. Torpor is this uh, interesting thing. Think of torpor as kind of a, um, uh, a, a mini hibernation, if you will. This mini hibernation is that uh, the, the average body core temperature of our birds out there, it runs about 104 to 107 degrees Fahrenheit. This is pretty warm. I mean, you and I, 98.6, right? The birds mm -hmm. are much higher and they need to keep that that kind of body heat inside there there's a lot of different things you got to think about too when you think about 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 a small little bird the temperature gradient from inside the bird okay from the core of the bird at 107 degrees to the outside air temperature is only about i don't know what maybe an inch <laughs> you know so mm -hmm. there's not a lot of uh kind of uh a space there and the shorter the space, the greater the temperature gradient, and the greater the temperature gradient, the more they lose heat. So this is very important for these birds to be able to conserve the heat, and they do this through a process called torpor. Now, I would mentioned about how the birds shiver to keep warm. So what happens at night is the bird stops shivering for a, for a moment of time. Uh, could be a minute, two minutes, three minutes, and it slowly starts to lower the body core temperature of these birds. And as that body core temperature lowers, they start to lose consciousness. They shiver to kind of maintain the heat, and then they stop, and their body core temperature drops down a little bit more. Then they shiver, and it drops down a little bit more. Then they shiver, and they drop down a little bit more. These birds are able to lower their body core temperature upwards of 10 degrees. Now, if you and I, Mel, if we were to drop our body core temperature 10 degrees, we'd be in critical condition and it, it, it'd be hypothermia and we'd be in big, big trouble. Yep. But these birds are able to then maintain that lower body core temperature all night long, conserving fat reserves. Because by morning, if they don't have enough fat and they've run out of fuel, they're running out of gas, they will die. So it's important that these birds will do this. Um, and so Towards morning, the shivering starts up again. The period of time in between the shivering and non-shivering decreases. And as their body core temperature comes back up to normal operating, they regain consciousness and they're able to go back out again. This is truly amazing stuff. Hey, Stan. Yes. There's a couple of questions might tie in here. I'm not sure the flow because we never share our, our discussions until we're here on the air together. Yeah. Some people ask, you know, 
Uh, do I do they need more suet in the winter? What feed should I feed? And of course, a few weeks ago we talked to them about you know that's the time of the year when I like the highest energy feed. The, the you know the yeah. suet that truly is suet peanuts peanut butter, peanuts, uh, peanut butter. black oil sunflower seeds are better yet kernels. Is, is, are you in agreement with that sort of thing? Absolutely. The more fat, the better. Uh, these, okay. These birds. I, I thought about talking about this tonight. Birds have two types of fat. They have a brown fat and they have a white fat. And they're, both of those fats do two different things. And I thought about it, but we just don't have enough time to get into that tonight. Um, suffice to say, if you get a chance, um, uh, I, I kind of freak people out with this one all the time. Come Thanksgiving, which is, you know, coming up in a month or so, uh, come Thanksgiving when you're carving up your turkey, take a look at it. You're going to see different things. If you look a little closer at your turkey, you're going to notice there's white meat and there's dark meat. Why is that? Maybe maybe that should be one of our topics uh, when we come up. And I love to put that out for people to think about because it is there's very specific reasons for the different color of the meat on our on our birds and things like that. Mm -hmm. so very interesting stuff. By the way, extra two points to anybody who can guess what this bird is on the screen right now. Kind of move on there. It's another one uh, that I find very interesting. So we've got birds doing all sorts of different adaptations, all sorts of things in which to um, uh, survive winter. Here's a willow ptarmigan that changes color from brown to white in the winter time. It's a great survival uh, strategy for these birds. In they stand, to that, somebody asked, does a goldfinch change colors to blend in? And, and they do the same thing. They're trying to look more not, like the... Yeah, but they're not blending in. They're just yeah. changing colors because yeah. uh, they're not breeding. And I always like to say, look, if you're, you know, if you're not uh, if you're not breeding, then why try advertising, right? <laughs> so this is the feet of a willow ptarmigan. Look at these crazy looking feet, but then in the winter time, look at that. Wow. Feathers all over. A lot of people say that looks like fur, looks like hair. And it's, remember, not mammals; these are birds. And so it's got modified feathers all over their feet. Really interesting things. And a lot of times, what these birds will do to survive the winter because they don't migrate and they live up in the Arctic, they dive into snow banks, fluffy snow, and they cover themselves completely in snow. And that's how they spend their winter nights. And you know, up in the Arctic, boy, those nights are awfully long. Here's yeah. the rough grouse. This is more kind of a more familiar bird to a lot of people, the rough grouse. They don't change color, but they do the same exact adaptation, same exact behavior as the uh, willow ptarmigan. And, and that is at night, they dive into a snowbank, into fluffy snow, completely cover themselves and uh, stay there all night long. Some of these birds, when we have a raging storm that goes on for three or four days, they will stay inside that little snow burrow uh, for three or four days before they come out because the air temperature can be anywhere from, you know, anywhere from 32 down to like 32 below. Uh, right. but generally speaking, to be well below zero, but inside that snow, it's usually right around 32 degrees. So it's incredibly warmer inside the snow than it is outside the snow. And, and it's funny too, with these rough grouse, when they do that and they spend a bunch of time in, in one of those snow banks, when the snow melts out, there are big piles of the rough grouse poop where they're all ah. sitting, because it's been there yeah. for three days. Yeah. Yeah, that's really something else too. Bald eagles adapt, don't really do a great migration. What do they do up here? They move to open water. So they're going to move out of uh, some areas and move into open areas like this. Now look at that. There's a few bald eagles for you. This is we have it. River. We have it happen down here too, Stan. They go down to yeah. Bagno Dam Lake or they go along the Mississippi River by yeah, the locks. The Mississippi at the locks. That's the one. And, and you get uh, things like this where you get hundreds of eagles that all gather up together and then they're doing what they're fishing of course they're snatching the fish out of the river the fish that have been stunned at the dip at the locks and dams and it's easy picking for these birds the important thing here is to know that these birds are not really having problems with the cold temperatures that doesn't bother them they can handle it they just need to find open water where they can fish and make a living more and more we're seeing in places like here in minnesota where all of our lakes freeze up the eagles are able to survive the winter simply by eating roadkill. So they're going around and eating roadkill instead of fishing or instead of moving to the open waters like along the Mississippi River. 
So many birds switch their uh, diets when it comes to winter. A red-bellied woodpecker goes from an insect-eating bird to a seed-eating bird in the winter time. So big changes, big adaptations here for like red bellies. Some birds like our uh, northern flicker here, most of them migrate, but guess what? Some of them don't. You got those outliers, you got those rule breakers, those ones that don't follow the rules, they don't read the books that we write for them, and they do whatever the heck they wanna do. And so you get northern flickers who normally eat insects. This is how they normally, they normally feed on the ground, eating ants and things like that. And here they are in the middle of winter, still staying around, quite an interesting condition. So you talked about a little bit about winter finch forecast. Um, the winter finch forecast doesn't look really good for this winter, ex with the exception of a few different species. I'm going to talk about those up, uh, coming up soon. Those winter finch uh, forecast is looking at uh, up in Canada, looking at what the uh, pine cone uh, production looks like. Was it a good spring? Was it a good summer? Is there a lot of pine cones? Is there a lot of seeds for these birds? And if there's not, these winter finches, and there's a whole list of these winter finches, come down out of the north and they come into the northern tier states and as far they can make it as far south as uh, Missouri also and there are things like this like this is an evening gross beak uh, and they come out here's a female evening gross beak uh, these guys are amazing birds that uh, kind of come out of the uh, out of the north and uh, come down into areas we've got our common red poles these things move around to find sources of foods they're usually in big flocks they descend on your feeders, they descend on uh, different areas, and they just eat, 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 and then off they go again. So it's kind of interesting. This year, it's predicted that pine siskins are gonna be coming down in the east, not in the west. So the eastern states should be seeing some uh, pine siskins. Already people are reporting pine siskins. Uh, we're seeing groups of 20 to 30 to 40 of them showing up at different feeders. The pine siskins kind of a, an interesting bird. Look how narrow and thin that bill is. They are a, a real seed eater and they will, you know, kind of an exclusive seed eater and, and they're a little brown with a little bit of yellow on them. I think, I think they're just a kind of an understated bird. I really like them. And then the red breasted nuthatches. These guys are, um, are coming down right now. In fact, I've got some at my feeders right now. And these are northern uh, birds. They're part, they're not a finch, but they're part of that northern finch group and they kind of uh, bust out of that northern area and come down into um, areas like uh, they'll make it as far south as uh, as even Florida sometimes too. These are an amazing, uh, fun little bird. So many of these birds we only see in the winter time. So there's a small percentage of some birds like American robins that don't migrate at all. These are the rule breakers. These are the ones that say, hey, you know what? I'm going to hang out here and I'm going to tough it out for the winter time and I'm going to do just fine. They tend to move to areas that have high berry production and they feed on the berries and then they move around in flocks. The more eyes there are, the more food that they find. So, and then there's things like this, Eastern bluebirds, that even though it's snowing and it's Christmas time, they're still here sometimes and they're still feeding, trying to find food wherever they can find it. So, and then think of it this, this way too, some waterfowl don't migrate. We got things like trumpeter swans or Canada geese and uh, mallards who don't migrate at all. Uh, some of them hang out. Again, these rule breakers. Um, there's a lot of studies show that these birds, the, the ones who return to the breeding grounds the soonest get the best spots and are the most successful at reproducing. So it makes sense for some of them to try to not migrate because they want to try to get back into, uh, into the breeding grounds as fast as they can. So it's kind of an interesting hodgepodge of, of strategies and things that birds do in order to uh, survive winter. And then of course, we cannot forget our backyard bird feeding. Mel, this is one of the things that uh, these birds have been around for millions of years. Our birds, our modern birds, the birds that we see today, most of them have been around from anywhere from one to upwards of three to four, and some of, or sometimes up to five million years. They've been around a long time and they've adapted and they've kind of developed these strategies for surviving winter and have done just fine. We've been backyard bird feeding ever since about world, the end of World War II. So only about 50 to 70 years, we've been really kind of, as a nation, really feeding backyard birds on a regular basis. And so this is a relatively new wild card. And, it, and it's, it's interesting to see, will this change behavior over time? 
uh, because these things kind of tend to develop over time slowly. Will it change their behavior? And will it give some birds an advantage? Uh, we don't know. There's some speculation, but it's a really an interesting uh, topic. And so, but they've, there's a couple of questions to the fact that you know they do fend for themselves, even though we don't feed them. And that's you know, right. they, another question is what do they eat? And of course, they're looking for seeds and fruits and and that sort of thing. Yep. Uh, but uh, it, you know, I always tell everybody. To me, it's for us as much as for them. It's just a way for us to get engaged in nature and then be cognizant of things like the native plants that provide natural food for them that God had here right. uh, and not just mess up the world with uh, chemicals and, and plants that become invasive, that sort of thing. Yeah. I see you got one of your new books up there. Yeah, I've got the uh, the uh, Backyard uh, or the be, uh, Birding for Beginners books. Here's another one here. Um, uh, you know, I just want to kind of uh, emphasize what you had just said. Backyard bird feeding is not for the birds. It's for you. It's for you to bring nature closer for us to feel more connected to the earth. I'm a firm believer that the more we know, the more we understand about the earth, the better we take care of it. And that is very, very important. And it's kind of at the heart of everything I've done in my 32 years of writing books uh, and, and being a wildlife photographer, that's where it really lies. And it really is important that we make that connection with the earth because you really don't care for something uh, uh, that you don't know anything about. When you know something about it, you tend to take better care of it. So therefore, I believe that backyard birding is a fabulous way to kind of bring nature to us and get us more connected. And of course, my target audience, most of all, and I know it's one of your stand, is it's getting children involved with nature and understanding, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the great gifts that God has out there in the wildlife, and and not just worried about computer screens and phone screens and that sort of thing. Yeah, we had we had twenty. Uh, kindergartners at the Nature Center today. So cool. I am so familiar with getting kids in, involved. There you this go. Is what I do, and I've, I've spent my whole career doing this. It's been fantastic. There you go. Hey, well, is, that the, is that the end? Hey, thank yeah. you very, very much. I, let's sneak in a couple questions yeah, real quick. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, a couple, somebody asked, when you were on the feathers, there are a couple people, uh, I'll just hit them to you all at once, and then you can go, go through it. They said, do they... When do they shed those feathers, those downy feathers ah, in, in the spring? How many times do they change those feathers? And how do you know how many feathers a goldfinch has? <laughs> so let's, let's start from the bottom and work our way up. How many feathers do um, there are actually uh, mostly graduate students who are uh, studying different birds who are uh, charged with um, uh, taking a bird, a dead bird, obviously, uh, from a collection, and they pluck the bird and they count the feathers. They group okay. them into the different types of feathers and they count them. This is called science. This right. is when you actually learn these things by doing these types of things. So right. it may seem like a gruesome job, but it has to be done and it, and it gives us a lot of information. Um, can you think of a bird that has um, the uh, most amount of feathers, Mel? Oh, Lordy, I don't know. I'll give you a hint. It's a big waterfowl. It's our biggest waterfowl that we have. The trumpeter swan. Trumpet. Oh, you got me. Yeah, yep. the trumpeter yep. swan. Yep. Take a guess how many feathers. If we've got 1,200 feathers on a, on a chickadee, how many are on a trumpeter swan? Oh, God. They must have 12,000 then. Yep, 22,000 feathers Holy on, moly. on average yeah. for, for these yeah. guys. So. And Amazing. then how, do, how often do they change them? Uh, most of our backyard birds... Uh, only molt, that's the, the term for it, molting, once a year. So they change their feathers over slowly. Uh, they, they, can you imagine? It'd be like Foghorn Leghorn, you know, that old cartoon yeah. character. When Foghorn Leghorn, when all those feathers would fall out, yeah, you know, yeah. It, he'd get some explosion and all his feathers would come out and he'd put them all back in. Um, that's how it would be if birds molted all their feathers at the same time. They molt them uh, kind of in an orderly fashion across their body in rows. And then, so one row comes out, new ones start to grow in, and then the next row comes out and new ones start okay. to grow in. So you don't even notice it. Some birds, like the American goldfinch, actually molt twice a year. That's unusual. Yeah. It's a, it's one question, one and, and I regret that I didn't have a, a roosting box on the table, although a couple of these pockets work the same way. But particularly on a roosting box, somebody asked, how would you mount one? And I got my own ideals, but I'd, I'd, I'd ask you, do you have a favorite direction, a favorite height, favorite spot? 
Um, a lot of people say that they like to face them to the east because when the sun comes up in the morning, it helps to warm up the box. Um, I think of it this way. When you're thinking about a natural cavity in which they would normally be roosting in, the, the direction of the hole really isn't uh, planned, is it? It's kind of what it was. And so in nature, they kind of go in any cavity that faces any direction. So really, it shouldn't really matter. But I know people, we like to overthink these things. And we like to say, put, try to put some logic to it and all that. And we like to think, well, maybe we should go east. Uh, maybe not to the north because that's where the oh. coldest winds come from. Those types of things. So you could go east or south. And then I, I like to put it in a place where um, the squirrels can't get to because you put yeah. up a roosting box and what's going to happen is squirrels are going to chew their way in there and that'll be the end of that. You bet. Well, Stan, thank you very much. I know there's one last comment I'll make is uh, I do notice that uh, in particular the goldfinches and I think my hummingbirds do sometimes as it gets colder. I, I, I watch where I have my feeders and I intentionally yep. have some that get the early, early morning sun. Yeah. And it does it does seem like they go to those first and particularly uh, I pay attention, we leave some dead branches and stuff. Uh, and in the summertime, that's more important than, than the wintertime as far as a perch. But those guys, they like catching those morning rays as part of, of heating up. So uh, people might try that and then let us know what they find. But uh, Stan, it was a great program tonight. Thank you so very much for joining us. Absolutely, Mel. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to people about my favorite thing. Hey, you, oh, you're very welcome. And uh, as we wrap up, I did want to uh, thank Stan again so much for sharing another night with us. I want to thank Kevin for setting up, Jeffrey for being here with me, and Erica and Annette, my daughter Becky, they're all behind the screens when I leave here. Keep those questions coming. Becky helps me when I get home. You know, if I did them here, I did that one night. My spelling's horrible when I'm doing it. So I dash home and we'll keep answering your questions. That helps you to win those prizes. Don't forget to, if you liked what you saw, tag this and tell a friend about it and get them to join us. And, you know, if you join us next week, we're going to be talking about a different subject. And you'd say, why this time of year? Well, fall is for planting. I wear this little buttock button here that says gardening for wildlife all the time. And native plants are one of the best ways to attract butterflies. So I thought, hey, let's get people interested. And we, uh, you're going to see some fun things next week when Joe Edwards covers uh, monarchs and all kinds of other butterflies and things you can do to, to enjoy them and to get children interested in them. So uh, appreciate that and uh, you know if you saw something you liked here tonight or when you need that high energy bird seed we talked about uh, you know reach out to that local independently owned retailer they're the guys that will help you figure out where to feed it, how to feed it, what what attracts the birds you want. And those you guys in Songbird at Station area here in Central Missouri, it's not too late to take advantage of our seed booking. So come on in and see Holly and Deb and, and they'll take good care of you. They know an awfully lot about birds. They could be up here if they wanted to. So uh, again, we just thank Stan very much. If you're looking for a field guide, make sure you look for one of Stan's. They come from Adventure Publications. We stock them most wild bird stores and lawn and garden and nurseries that are serious about birding. They'll have his books. So. All these things, like he said, is just part of trying to get you and your children and your family to get involved in nature know about it. Because as I close every session, I want to remind you, nature is a stress reliever from God. Take time today to listen to the birds sing. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll see you next week when we talk butterflies. Thanks.